Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in this lecture, I would like to talk about fuses and fuse-like things. So we've been talking about how to protect circuits. And one of the main reasons is to protect yourself in addition to protecting the circuit. Now, one thing to be careful with fuses is fuses are really about protecting the circuit. They're not going to be doing a whole lot to protect you. They're part of the equation, but they're not the complete equation. So we'll talk about protecting you more next time when we talk about grounding and isolation. These lecture materials were originally created for the junior ECE design fundamentals class we teach at Georgia Tech, but I also use it for my guitar amplification and effects class, and it's also available as a resource for students working on their capstone design project. And I need to give credit to my wonderful colleague Steve Kenny, who created the original PowerPoint slides. So, as far as fuses go, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes for different applications. Occasionally, people will need to go to an auto parts store and pick up one if they've messed up installing their car stereo. I remember these kinds of fuses from my childhood. This is the kind of fuse we had in the house that I grew up in. These are fairly rare in houses nowadays. Generally, these have all been replaced with circuit breakers. Every once in a while, something will go wonky with your guitar amplifier and you'll have to replace a fuse. If you have to replace your fuse quite a bit, something's wrong with your amp and you should take it to a tech and get that fixed. And one thing you should never do is to try to take some random piece of metal and shove it into the fuse socket to get your amp working for the gig. Don't do that. Replace it with a proper fuse. One thing to keep in mind about fuses is that fuses are about protecting from too much current not too much voltage. You need something else to protect from over voltage. So there is a voltage rating for your fuse, and this is basically the point at which your fuse, once it's blown, stops being an open circuit and starts arcing and acting more like the world's most insane plasma wire or something. So don't go there. You don't want to get anywhere near that voltage rating. So what's shown here is a bunch of different curves for a bunch of fuses with different ratings. And basically this curve describes how long the amp can go at a certain amperage without blowing. There's two general kinds of fuses. There's fast blow fuses and slow blow fuses. On these, I typically have a hard time figuring out if it's actually blown or not just by looking at it. So I'll take an ohmmeter and measure continuity. As you can see here, the slow blow fuses are going to be more tolerant of quick current spikes, such as the inrush that you'll get from starting something like a light bulb. And this is relevant for guitar amplifiers that contain vacuum tubes, because vacuum tubes at their core are basically light bulbs. Now, as far as high speed electronics go, even fast blow fuses aren't quite fast enough, so you usually want some other forms of protection along the line. And in terms of that voltage rating I mentioned earlier, for something like your wall current, a good rule of thumb is to just double the mains voltage. Sometimes people will put the fuse on the PCB itself. You want to put this somewhere you can get without removing a bunch of other stuff. I've even seen some old test equipment. I think it was Tektronix, but I can't remember for sure, that basically had a fuse holder next to the main fuse holder and that second fuse holder wasn't actually hooked to anything. It was just a place to store a spare fuse. How awesome is that? Nobody builds stuff like that anymore. My favorite place to put it is actually with a hatch that's accessible from the outside. There's these great plugs you can get that have a standard IEC power connector with a fuse holder next to it. A particularly wonderful kind of fuse for applications where they're applicable is known as the positive temperature coefficient fuse. I've also seen these called poly fuses. So the great thing about these is that once they trip, you don't actually have to replace them. You can remove the power and they'll reset themselves. These seem to be popular nowadays for people building Eurorack synthesizer modules, especially because the Eurorack standard has a horrible power connector that's not polarized, so people will tend to plug in their power backwards. Unfortunately, as wonderful as polyfuses are, 
they're restricted to relatively low power systems. So you're not going to be using them for the power for an entire building or some really beefy piece of industrial equipment. As I mentioned before, circuit breakers have largely replaced standard fuses in housing applications. And although they're a lot more expensive than regular fuses, the nice thing about them is you don't have to replace them. When they trip, you can just reset them. There are some applications like two bass guitar amplifiers I mentioned earlier where it's okay to have a little bit of extra current rushing in at the beginning that's expected and you use a slow blow fuse to handle that. But there are some more specialized applications where you do want to limit that initial current rush. The details of doing that well would really require their own lecture. And this slide just presents some ideas for you to get started in your own research. This is outside my own area of expertise, so if I needed to dig into this, I would knock on the door of some of my colleagues. So fuses and circuit breakers are all about current. While we're at it, let's talk a little bit about overvoltage protection. And I like to think about that as having three different domains. One is the case where somebody has taken a power supply of a certain voltage and plugged it into a device that wants a lower voltage. Say somebody's taken a 12 volt supply and they plug it into something that's expecting a 5 volt supply. This is particularly a problem given the ubiquity of the 2.1 millimeter DC power jack, which I believe is the root of most evil. Overvoltage protection at the power source could be something as simple as a Zener diode strapped across the power supply input, like in the Boss CE2 chorus pedal. This is not actually terribly impressive, but it's something. More sophisticated techniques out there will tend to use MOSFETs as switches. The second regime I tend to think about in terms of overvoltage protection is the case where somebody decides to put too many volts into one of the signal inputs into one of your devices like a fragile microcontroller. In those cases, handling your input protection with various combinations of diodes is reasonable, and I would highly recommend this article by DigiKey. I'll put a link to it in the description below. The third regime of overvoltage protection lies outside the realm of human error and into the realm of nature. For handling things like lightning strikes, you're going to need things like spark gaps. And then there's a variety of other technologies like gas discharge tubes and metal oxide varistors that can handle various power spikes coming from your wall current. All of that was about protecting the circuit and that's part of protecting you from dangers, but it's not the whole story. We'll speak more about this next time when we talk about grounding and isolation. Before we close out this lecture, I wanted to show this slide. I'm not going to go through it here, but Steve Kinney, my colleague, put a lot of work into it. So if you want to learn more about the details of fuses, you can pause the video now and absorb this in detail. Otherwise, I will see you next lecture.